The revolution is real. It's live. And as some comrades say, it's lit. Right? <laughs> Lit. 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 The revolution is lit. Uhuru comrades, and welcome to today's Omali Taught Me Sunday Study featuring Chairman Omali Ishichello. My name is Tichara Masimba, Director of Economic Development in the Office of the Deputy Chair for the African People's Socialist Party as well as your MC for this morning. Today's study is highly important and we encourage you right now to share this stream, invite your friends and family to it so as many of our people can be involved in this discussion. In this week's study, Chairman will read chapter one from his most recent book, Vanguard, The Advanced Detachment of the African Revolution, the political report to the Seventh Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. For the last two decades and more, the black revolution of the 60s has been carried by the African People's Socialist Party. As said by Chairman in an overview to the National Central Committee the highest governing body of our party and featured in the January 2020 burning spear in the column, point of the spear, quote, we have forged this process for almost 50 years and it's the continuum of the struggle that is concentrated in the African People's Socialist Party, especially since the revolution was defeated, end quote. In the study, the chairman will deepen our understanding of the task of the vanguard, what is required, what is our responsibility and why the party assumes the role of the vanguard. We encourage our online viewers during the study to leave questions in the comment section so that chairman can answer them at the end of the reading. It is my honor to introduce the leader and founder of the African People's Socialist Party, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, my leadership chairman, Omali Ishitella. Brothers and sisters and comrades, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming out uh, for today's study. I said coming out because uh, I'm right now in St. Louis, and it's a bit nippy, to say the least. And I uh, uh, had to get up this morning and shove snow off our windows and car windows and things like that. But I uh, really want to express appreciation to these brave and hardy souls who are here uh, with me at the Uhuru House uh, in St. Louis. <laughs> and I would also like to just uh, say that um, the last two studies uh, revolved uh, primarily around questions that people had raised uh, in previous studies uh, that didn't get uh, an opportunity uh, to be uh, discussed. And one of those, however, that I overlooked was, uh, if I remember correctly, a question by someone who wanted to know if what I was putting forth in the study uh, suggested that uh, the original nation of Islam did not play 
a meaningful role uh, in bringing uh, a certain kind of consciousness to African people. And uh, it may have appeared uh, that I, I, I implied that, uh, but if it did, it was absolutely uh, incorrect. The truth is that uh, the nation of Islam, the original nation of Islam, and Elijah Muhammad uh, played uh, fundamental roles in uh, that period of struggle, uh, uh, certainly uh, <coughs> in the 50s and early parts of the 60s. Uh, it, they were boldly declaring uh, that, uh, that uh, African people uh, should be able to do for ourselves. It was a really important kind of anti-colonial statement, and it smashed, shattered all of the assumptions associated with the superiority of white people uh, uh, going so far as to characterize the white man as the devil. And uh, uh, it was really, really important in terms of what it did uh, for helping Africans to break the psychological sh shackles uh, that uh, uh, colonial terror, uh, oppression, degradation had imposed on us. And the Nation of Islam has to also be credited with uh, attracting uh, the man to its ranks that would... Uh, we would see as our ideological leader at the time. When I say we, I'm talking about the African People's Socialist Party, many of those who were attracted to, uh, to this tendency. And that, of course, was Malcolm X. And uh, so we don't, we don't, I don't, and the party does not uh, dismiss the significance of the nation of Islam, uh, the bold declarations that are made, the... the, the uh, the call that it made for African people to be uh, self-determining, to do for self. Uh, we have uh, fundamental differences with them, uh, but it was really important for what had happened, uh, what they did. In fact, there was a time in my own development where, though not religious, uh, I attempted to join the Nation of Islam uh, precisely because of the deep uh, anti-colonial message that was associated with it. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. Uh, secondly, uh, what I'd like to say is that uh, on February, from February 1st through the 3rd, uh, the African People's Socialist Party will be uh, conducting our first, seventh, uh, uh, our first seventh Congress plenary uh, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, people, of course, in the African People's Socialist Party and the Hula Movement are expected to be there, but others of you are invited uh, as well. That's going to be in St. Petersburg, Florida from February 1st through 3rd. Our plenary is uh, something that uh, we attempt to do annually uh, between Congresses. The Congress is at that time where our party comes together uh, uh, more or less under the leadership of the rank and file uh, membership that will uh, discuss, uh, struggle around, uh, adopt the political report to the Congress that has been presented by uh, the chair. And uh, a period of three to four months uh, will, prior to the Congress, there will be discussions around the political report. And then at the Congress itself, some discussions, and it would be voted on by the entire uh, party organization. And this is the this is the fundamental uh, aspect of the democracy in democratic centralism. And then uh, that Congress will elect its leadership that it uh, is required uh, to carry out uh, the political uh, report uh, that the Congress membership has voted on. So the, 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 the Congress membership votes on this report and then elects leaders who have the responsibility uh, to carry out that political report uh, and who are given the authority uh, to make that happen by that democratic vote and to exercise uh, centralist uh, leadership to make that happen. And then we try, uh, uh, at least annually, we attempt to do it annually, at, at the plenary where there is a tradition. We are going to be over, by the, we're going to be, this is going to be 
uh, something like a, a year and a half following the 7th Congress that happened in St. Louis uh, in October of last year. Uh, but uh, this will, uh, uh, we will have this opportunity to check up, see where we are, see what has changed, see what it is that we have to do, and what kinds of uh, uh, contributions we can make to uh, developing what came out of that uh, 7th Congress. So that's where we'll be. And all of you are invited to be there. It's going to be a really important uh, Congress because we, we've learned so much, even in that short period of time, as you can imagine, with the crisis of this rotten, foul social system uh, revealing itself uh, more and more every day, uh, not only in terms of the contest, the struggle that's happening within the uh, imperialists, uh, among the imperialists, uh, 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 savages themselves uh, from country to country, but also within the uh, ranks of the ruling, uh, the currently uh, uh, shaky, shaky uh, center of that uh, imperialist uh, empire being the United States. All of these, these crises, and then, as you know, uh, the savage assassination by the United States government of uh, a governmental official uh, open nakedly called for targeted assassination of a government official of uh, Iran, of Iran, and uh, uh, which was incredible. And then after the assassination, the threat of the people uh, and the Iranian government not to respond. And then subsequent to that, uh, in my view, uh, a U.S. instigated. Uh, and I mean uh, instigated uh, 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 attack, a flight, missile attack on a, on a flight uh, from Iran that the Iranian government uh, uh, has assumed responsibility for a passenger plane being shot down. And I say instigated, but I, I believe uh, it's, it could be considered instigation uh, because the United States uh, uh, has uh, offered such a, a provocative uh, 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 assault impression uh, on the Iranian people and government. It's not something imaginary. They killed and said they killed uh, a, a general uh, there, assassinated him. Uh, and then, uh, of course, they engage, they have been engaging for many years now uh, various kinds of assaults. Uh, they have bombed sites, they have uh, assassinated scientists, they have uh, 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 used uh, uh, viruses, it, 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 it installed viruses along with the, the, the vicious uh, uh, white settler regime of, uh, of uh, Israel, uh, Stuxnet, Stuxnet viruses uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, destroy or undermine the ability of the uh, Iranian government to uh, carry out its uh, nuclear modernization, nuclear modernization uh, process there. And this, of course, is the same government, the United States, that overthrew uh, the Iranian government, uh, the duly elected Iranian government of Mohammad Mossadegh in 1953. So this, all of this is the, sets the context for uh, the, the Iranian uh, government uh, to be on high alert uh, and anxious about any kind of uh, what might be considered by them unusual movement uh, coming from uh, uh, potentially uh, the direction of the United States that's just recently attacked them by murdering uh, uh, a leader. So that's part of what, I, what could be assumed to be meant by instigation, but uh, there are other things that we know uh, about uh, the... The other thing that we know about the, uh, the U.S. government and uh, some of the uh, uh, so sophisticated uh, uh, equipment that they have, uh, they, we saw them uh, sometime earlier, in, uh, uh, some years ago, and I can't remember whether it was Russia or China, where they tricked the Russian or, or Chinese into shooting down uh, a passenger flight. Uh, they have an ability uh, to, uh, to uh, create an image on the radar uh, mm -hmm. that would, could make an air uh, a plane, even a passenger plane, give it the appearance of uh, some kind of military uh, uh, vessel. 
of a uh, uh, plane. And uh, they did that, and they, they faked either, it was either the Chinese or the Russians, I can't remember now, uh, several years ago, into shooting down a passenger plane. Uh, they never accepted responsibility for it, but that's what happened. And it's quite possible that they did the same thing with the Iranian plane. Uh, and uh, so I just wanted to mention, you know, those things. The, the point is that the crisis of imperialism is deep and profound. And uh, we are living and working in that. And that's a part of what influences uh, establish the context for the plenary that we're having. Uh, so a lot has happened since uh, our 7th Congress in October uh, of last year. Uh, a lot has happened. And the plenary will reflect that. Comrades, uh, the title of the plenary, the theme of the plenary, is kind of, kind of, uh, what do you call it? Nippy. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the theme of the plenary is uh, uh, Vanguard Up, the unity of theory and practice. I think the temperature is all right in, in this building, comrades. Uh, uh, and... This also is a reflection of the theme of, of the 7th Congress, uh, Vanguard, African People's Socialist Party, Vanguard, the Advanced Attachment of the African uh, Revolution. And this concept of Vanguard is something that has been uh, misunderstood uh, for a period of time. Uh, it, it, it speaks to really to a particular kind of organization. Uh, and on the one hand, on the other hand, it also speaks uh, from our perspective to uh, the membership, the, this issue of Vanguard and Vanguard Up is a statement to the membership of the African People's Socialist Party to assume a particular role and a particular stance. And uh, we are up against a, a monster, this incredible monstrosity that has been imposed on the whole planet, that now it is normal things that are characterized as normal. For example, uh, the United States uh, is a settler entity. The, what is called the United States uh, uh, government, the United States uh, population is a settler population. The United States government uh, is one that established itself on, on land of the indigenous populations, uh, many of whom uh, were wiped out uh, in the process and they settle here. It's a settler colony, uh, much like uh, uh, the, uh, what was it, Rhodesia, much like what is South Africa, where Europeans left Europe. It's not like uh, uh, they simply came and colonized us, uh, as they have done in some places. They've colonized people, but the objective was not to settle there. Uh, but the situation in Europe uh, was such that it was better. This isn't what needs to be understood. That's, uh, people, it was better for white people to leave Europe than try to stay there. And uh, uh, they were looking for uh, greener pastures of what to speak. Obviously, one aspect of that was looting. And looting did occur all over uh, the, what is now known as the Americas. Uh, looting expeditions were, uh, did occur. Uh, and, uh, of course, the enslavement of African people uh, the aggression on Africa, the enslavement of Africa people, the consequences of that action, of those actions, the consequences are now the norm, the normal. What is normal is what we now call the United States. Uh, and what is normal is that the fact that the, these concentration camps that's called Indian reservation, that's normal now. What is normal is African people uh, in these colonies that's called ghettos and stuff like that and, and uh, Mexicans and what have in barrios, this is normal. All of this came as a consequence of Europe leaving Europe and attacking the rest of us uh, and then, and then uh, pro pro providing us this, this, this situation that we have to live with. All of Europe has uh, grown and benefited from this and all the white people in the world grew and benefited from this. And the majority of the rest of us uh, suffered as a consequence of it. This is the norm within which we are functioning. And it's hard for people's brains to break out of uh, this norm, to be able to, uh, I think people refer to this as a, a paradigm or something to that effect. It's very difficult uh, for people to understand the world outside of the context of this established 
norm or paradigm. And that's what we're up against. And that's what we have to do. One, two, colonialism is nasty. It is brutal. Now, right now, we are living in a situation where this contest between sectors of the ruling class has white people and some others uh, braying about uh, pending fascism or fascism may be here. And uh, I don't deal with, and the African People's Socialist Party uh, is not concerned with some pending fascism. Because this question of fascism is one that gets discussed uh, as contradictions occur uh, within, basically within the population that occupies uh, a station in life uh, 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 resting on the colonial domination of the world. Now, with the advent of capitalism in the world, which came through slavery and colonialism, there also emerged what people refer to as a bourgeois democracy for the capitalists. Bourgeois democracy for white people. Uh, uh, this is what occurred. And the, many of the Marxists uh, have referred to this bourgeois democracy as a hidden dictatorship. Certainly that was how Lenin would characterize as a hidden dictatorship of the ruling class. It's hidden uh, because there is the appearance of due process, there's the appearance of electing officials, there's the appearance of people uh, having the right now uh, to be able to sell the labor power, go out and get a job and stuff like that if they're any available and the imperialist crisis does not represent itself so drastically uh, that jobs are not available. That's, that's they said, that's a, bourge, that's a hidden uh, dictatorship. Bourgeois democracy is what they refer to as hidden dictatorship. But for Africans and colonized people, the dictatorship has never been hidden. And so what you see with this crisis that happens uh, within the system itself uh, on the pedestal of our oppression. This crisis that happens uh, for white people is at that time when the dictatorship is, no, is less hidden. And so that's what they refer to as fascism. Uh, when white people have this problem where the dictatorship of capital uh, expresses itself uh, in, a, in a way uh, that, uh, that uh, emulates uh, part of what happens to the rest of the world all the time. So well, I'm, of course, when you have a crisis of imperialism, you see that the imperialist, and imperialist forces uh, act uh, uh, you know, to uh, maintain this domination in a very serious way. So, so what used to be normal in terms of democratic rights and stuff like that, there's an ongoing encroachment on those rights by the system because uh, anything at this moment of crisis uh, tends to... Uh, threaten the stability of the social system itself. But for Africans, there has never been a time where the dictatorship was not hidden. On the plant slave plantations, after the plantations, Jim Crow, immigration, whatever you call it, we live with it every day of our lives. And it's a very brutal social system, not just Africans here, Africans around the world. I mean, Africans around the world have had to fight the, the, the colonial French power at the time when French was a part of the leading anti-fascist movement fighting against Germany and Hitler and all these other places. Our oppression, our exploitation did not come from Hitler, did not come from the Germans, it came from Churchill. And it came from Roosevelt, and it came from the Kennedys, and it came from all of these other forces who were Democrats. These were democratic colonialists as opposed to what might be characterized as anti-democratic or fascist colonialism. Colonialism is colonialism is colonialism. And at the moment we can get pushed into a struggle against fascism, we're trying to solve the problem for that sector of the white population for whom the dictatorship of, the, of, uh, of capital is beginning to reveal itself. As, uh, and so we end up fighting one sector of the, of fighting for one sector of the white population versus another sector. We never fight for ourselves and we don't fight against colonialism, whether it's a democratic colonialism or whether it's a fascist colonialism. Anyway, Colonialism is nasty, and it affects us every day, and it happens in broad daylight, and it's normal. Just like white people living on somebody else's land here in a settler situation is normal. Just like uh, the half the prison population in this country is African people is normal. Just like Indian reservations, as they characterize it, normal. Just as half of Mexico has been stolen uh, and this artificial border created there is normal. This is normal reality. 
And if you give some thought to it, whether what is characterized as normal is extraordinary. Because it, it reeks of oppression, exploitation, uh, the theft of the, the overthrow of the government, the murder of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the, the, the general in Iran. That's normal behavior. It's normal. And what has to happen is we have to destroy uh, this normality because it's killing Africans. And when we talk about vanguard, we're talking about forces in our movement, in our party. Uh, the party we say is vanguard. We say why. And we'll say something about this in this study. And I'm hoping that, you know, we can get through it effectively. Uh, and the members of the party are being asked to take a stance as vanguard, as people who recognize your own responsibility for vanguard because we have to destroy the norm. That's carrying a heavy load. That's going as swimming upstream. Uh, uh, ex especially when uh, the African population in general accepts this norm as normal. Might, might not like it, but it's normal. And the truth is, as, uh, as we know in the work that we do and the lives that we live, is that uh, an enslaved person uh, who is afraid of the future, an enslaved person who is afraid of the unknown will defend the slavery that he does know. That's just the reality. And that reality articulates itself in our daily lives on a regular basis, in our families and other stuff, because we got to break out of this. But we know pain. We are familiar with pain. We are familiar with homelessness. We are familiar with police brutality. We are familiar with disruption in our lives, etc. Cetera, et cetera. We are familiar with welfare systems. We are familiar with the white man being on top of everything. That's what we know. That's the slavery that we know. And, and an enslaved person who is afraid of the unknown will defend the slavery that he does know. And that's part of what it is that we're up against uh, in the party. And when we talk about Vanguard, uh, it's a profound statement because there's a kind of historically, uh, politically uh, created and enforced uh, inertia uh, that, we, uh, that we are moving with. And we're asking, we're saying that we got to break out of that. That's what we're saying when we talk about cadre, when we talk about uh, people in the party, vanguard up, vanguard up. It means overcoming all those things that stand between us and this, this freedom, this liberation, this African unification that we have never known. It means being who you never imagined yourself to be. To be the ruling class. The working class must be able to imagine itself as being the ruling class. That means extraordinary responsibility. Because those who rule the world today do not intend ever, 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 ever to accede to the oppressed, the right to be self-governing, self-determining, and self-reliant. And we have to remind ourselves of that in the party sometimes. There's no struggle that we have that is among ourselves and with the people that is greater than the struggle we have with this, this monstrosity. And the party is the instrument through which the people, the only instrument through which the people can realize liberation. And we have established right now through our history such a remarkable uh, resume that uh, should be, make it evident to people in the party who we are and our ability to carry this load that has been imposed on us by history. We, didn't vol we volunteered to do this we didn't volunteer to be here at this time in history, but having, having, now that we are here, we joined the African People's Socialist Party, we joined the Uhuru Movement, that's voluntary.
That's, that's making the statement that we will carry this load, regardless of what kinds of contradictions that we have to confront the way. So on the way. So starting on page 21. The Vanguard, the Advanced Detachment. This is chapter one of uh, the political report to the 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. Uhuru comrades, delegates, observers, and supporters of the 7th Congress of the African People's Socialist Party. During the five years since our 6th Congress, there have been many changes in the world and within our party. All of them have served to reinforce the significance of the African People's Socialist Party which for more than 46 years has provided leadership for the African nation and the oppressed and exploited workers of the world. Comrades, this Seventh Party Congress constitutes a firm salute to the indefatigable work of the African People's Socialist Party to forward the struggle for the liberation and unification of Africa and Africans, people under the leadership of the African working class. The continued uh, African working class, the continued unrelenting dedication of our party to complete the black revolution of the 60s is alive in the theme of this Congress, quote, the African People's Socialist Party vanguard attached the advanced detachment of the African revolution, unquote. Although our assertion that we are the vanguard and the advanced detachment sets us apart, from other organizations, it is not something said in contention with others. This is a declaration to you, the members of our party, calling on you to recognize the magnitude of your party membership and the role you have volunteered to carry out in the struggle for the liberation and unification of Africa and African people worldwide. Africans can be preoccupied, preoccupied with the consequences of colonialism. That that's, that's happens to us. So that if, if the oppressor creates conditions for us that we are preoccupied just to survive, just to survive, just for our family to survive, and then to survive within the structures of our family, and to survive in the communities that we live, not just be, not directly contesting with imperial white power and colonialism, but in the indirect contest with imperialism and in, in terms of the, the, the kind of horizontal violence, the consequences of poverty, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're constantly just having to deal with that and to step forward to be a member of the African People's Socialist Party to say that this contradiction I'm confronted with is not going to blind me. This contradiction in my neighborhood, this contradiction uh, in my family is not going to blind me to uh, the contradiction I have with this powerful social system that's responsible for everything. It's not going to get in my way. I am going to cut through this, go over this, go around this, under it, uh, somehow to get to the enemy. This is, this is what we are confronted with and this is what we are calling on Africans to do. We say vanguard up. We're saying that the most fundamental thing that we have to do is carry out the mission to liberate our people so that we don't have to live like this anymore. And that takes the long view. But the imperialism will keep you just fighting so that you can't see the long view. Every damn day is a struggle of existence. Every day is just a struggle to make it in this rotten, foul social system. So to step forward and say, I am a member of the African People's Socialist Party, is to say that I recognize that the great contest we are involved in is not with my neighbor, not with my husband, not with my wife, not with my brother, not with my sister, but this social system that has imposed these, these false contradictions on us are the contradictions that substitute uh, for uh, the real task that we have to overcome. That's, that's powerful to, to have somebody come out of this muck and mire that colonialism has imposed on us and say, I am going to step out of here and make this damn revolution. This is going to be the thing that consumes my existence, fighting out of this, and not just fighting out of it, fighting to win power so that we can create a different kind of world. This is not even the discussion we're supposed to be having. The slave is not supposed to be talking about becoming the ruling class. This is, 
an extraordinary discussion that you are being called on to, to take on as members of this party. So, an example of an advanced detachment is a unit or group of soldiers that goes out first to lead, lead and pave the way for the army in battle. And to go out first to pave the way is to run into all of the contradictions that the enemy has created for the whole people. We step out first. We are the ones, we are the vanguard. We step out first. So, and what happens is, generally speaking, the people feel always the brunt of the oppression, always, without distinction. But it's when you pre create this vanguard that's going to lead the people out of this, then the imperialists will target the, the vanguard. Not only will it target directly, but it will move even the people who the vanguard is moving to lead uh, into opposition against the vanguard, if it can do that. For our party, the advanced detachment of vanguard means that we have freely and enthusiastically stepped forward to lead the struggle for the total liberation and unification of Africa and our entire dispersed African nation, wherever we are located. The whole nation, everybody. We ain't leaving nobody behind. We are not some American descendants of slaves. We are descendants of a free people, a free people uh, who have been, have had, who have been brought into captivity by an imperialist power that built itself at our expense. We want everybody. We're coming to get everybody. That's what the vanguard does. We don't need anybody on the battlefield. We don't say we're just interested in five states over here and three over here or just in Grenada or just in uh, the Bahamas. We're like Garvey. Garvey, born in Jamaica, but understood the responsibility to lead all of Africans out of, out of oppression. That's why he said, Africa for Africans at home and abroad. Not just in Mississippi. Not just in St. Louis, all of which is stolen territory. Unlike any other African organization on the planet. This is why we say we're the vanguard. Our party, party is very serious about seizing African state power on our African continent. There's not another organization that even claims that as a goal. Our goal is to wrest back our land, our stolen resources, and the value of our stolen labor. Sometimes people refer to that as reparations. Under the leadership of the African working class in a liberated socialist Africa, we understand that no oppressed people has ever become free without the intervention of an organization of trained, disciplined cadre who are committed to winning liberation by overcoming every obstacle, including our own limitations. We are a party of professional revolutionaries. Our members have a variety of occupations. We are school teachers, barbers, construction workers, taxi drivers, and teachers, uh, uh, taxi drivers, and the like. We are also students, prisoners, Afri uh, office workers, and, and welders. We are cooks, and even lawyers. But whatever our occupation, our profession, is revolution. We are not dilettantes. Let me just say something about that, because we say our profession is revolution. There, you know, there is a... Uh, this assumption in some quarters uh, uh, that we are talking about our profession is carrying guns or doing so. Our profession is about overturning a social system that dominates African and African people in the conquest of political and economic power of our own. That's what our profession is about. And if we can get that by simply spreading peanut butter on the streets on 1600 whatever, that Pennsylvania Avenue, we'll do it. The oppressed never sets the terms for what it is to be free. The oppressor does this. The oppressor says, I'm not, you're not going to be over my dead body. That's, the oppressor says that. That's the only time the oppressed ever ends up saying, we're going to be free over your dead body, because the oppressor said there's no other way you can win your freedom. But whatever it takes to be free, that's what we are talking about doing. We do not start this discussion with placing limitations on what it is that we would do to be free. 
We are not dilettantes simply committed to faddish political work in our spare time. In fact, our profession as revolutionaries guarantees that there is no spare time when we are not advancing the struggle for the liberation of our people. This is what it means to be the vanguard, the advanced attachment. The African People's Socialist Party was co created to complete our revolution that had been crushed by a vicious U.S.-led counterinsurgency that defeated the black revolution of the 60s as it expressed itself globally. I'm not left-handed, but I got a left-handed coffee cup. <laughs> now, I know you might wonder how one gets a left-handed coffee cup. <laughs> But that's where the brand is on this side, and I have to show this brand, you see, uh, 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 because this is a fundraiser <laughs> for us, right? And so uh, there's an assumption, if you see this often enough, then there's a possibility that you'll make a contribution to our work by getting this, this cup. And uh, since the brand is this way, uh, and I want you to see it, I have to pretend to be left-handed, okay? <laughs> so, there was no other organization in the African world that both survived the counterinsurgency and took up the task to go beyond survival and mere adaptation to our inherited condition of defeat. Our party was bent on advancing the revolution the struggle for the total liberation and unification of Africa and the forcibly dispersed African nation everywhere. That it was, a party was bent on advancing the revolution. And then, it says, this is what the revolution is, it says. The struggle for the total liberation and unification of Africa and the forcibly dispersed African nation everywhere. That's what we're here for. That's what we were created for. We have done much uh, advanced work to resolve the many theoretical issues that otherwise would have been left unresolved by the ruthless colonial capitalist defeat of our movement, just as the most important questions were surfacing in our struggle. We are practical revolutionaries. We are not an organization of consumers and dispensers of information. We have chosen to lead in every way. We have chosen to be the advanced attachment of the African working class. We have chosen to be the vanguard. A party understands that in order to change the world to end our oppression, we must have the organization of vehicle to do so, and willing and trained cadre to carry out the task. This is why we are able to say African People's Socialist Party and vanguard in the same breath. A lot of people are groups, or there are several who consider themselves leaders of our movement, uh, leaders of African people, or uh, participants in the struggle for freedom, uh, but uh, are not moving and organizing toward uh, the capture of power, certainly by the African working class. We hear all of this stuff about resist. We are resistors. What, I mean, as long as there's imperialism, you're going to be resisting. As long as the so oppression happens, you're going to be resisting. But the fundamental question is to what end? To what end? So you just want to resist all the time? You can live uh, uh, in a nest of rattlesnakes. And you can spend all your time resisting snake bites. Or you can find a way to eradicate the snakes and take the space. So resisting in and of itself is not enough. The African People's Socialist Party is boldly declaring our intent to forge a revolutionary process to defeat imperialism. We are, not, we are not just talking, we are preparing to govern. We know parasitic capitalism was created and is maintained through its cruel, rapacious attachment to our Africa and our people. Our intention is to overturn it and replace it through a worldwide socialist revolution based on the forcibly, based, based in the forcibly dispersed international African nation wherever we are located. You know, there's an outstanding kind of uh, contradiction that has plagued uh, what has been characterized as the communist or socialist movement uh, since its advent. 
That is the question of what they would like to refer to uh, is socialism in one country. Uh, like, how can you have socialism in one country? And uh, there was an assumption by people like Karl Marx and uh, even D.I. Lenin that you can't have socialism in one country because uh, this would be you know, surrounded by all of these predator capitalist states. Either you have capitalism, you have socialism. And uh, so there were many who uh, opposed the Russian Revolution uh, that was led by the waged by the Bolsheviks, even people who were members of the Bolshevik Party, Lenin's uh, faction, revolutionary faction uh, of the communist movement uh, in the early 1900s. And because they said that, you know, you can't do this. First of all, that Russia does not meet the criterion that was established by Marx for having socialism uh, that must, according to Marx, come as about as the consequence of uh, the uh, capitalist development to its highest stage, more or less. And uh, then there was this other thing that uh, uh, a revolution made in Russia subsequent to the revolution could not uh, succeed, it could not be successful, uh, because it's just one state that socialism, communism was supposed to come as a consequence of the whole capitalist enterprise, more or less, uh, 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 coming into profound uh, contradiction uh, and socialism emerging as a consequence of capitalism, not Russia, not France, but capitalism as, as a, and this would be a process that would be ignited, led by the most advanced capitalist countries, and Russia certainly was not that. And uh, so there was some, and so this whole question of how can you have socialism in one country, we say you don't have to have it in one country. The African Revolution, what has happened is that in capitalism, imperialism, the Europeans have built in it the very uh, ingredients that will lead to its destruction. Because what has happened is the African Revolution is not something that happens just in Africa, it happens in St. Louis. It happens in, 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 uh, uh, in uh, the various uh, provinces in South Africa. It happens in Sweden. It's all over. It's a revolutionary movement. And the success of this movement uh, will bring about, uh, it resolves this, uh, what is, uh, appears to assume to be this contradiction about socialism in one country uh, because they have put the greatest enemies of capitalism, they have spread us out throughout the world. You know, uh, during uh, the Vietnamese Revolution, and they did a similar thing in Kenya, the French did a similar thing, in, uh, the British in Kenya, uh, they created these protected hamlets. Uh, I forgot whether it was in Kenya or in Vietnam that they called them, but the objective of this was to corral the population, the colonized population into these places, and then put fences around them and guns around them. Uh, to make sure uh, that the, uh, the revolutionaries couldn't get to them. So they'd move a village, an entire village, where revolution seemed to be heating up, and then put them this place. But what they were simply doing is moving the revolution from place to place, because the revolutionaries were every place. And so they took the revolutionaries, along with the rest of the people, to this place, and revolution happened, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what they have done uh, with the protected hamlets that they call ghettos, and by other names of African people throughout the world. So, the success of our party is a critical factor in the liberation and unification of Africa and the entire suffering African nation. It is not a little thing. It is for this reason we were able to report to our party's plenary in February 2012 that building the party is not only a crucial task of the African People's Socialist Party and our members, it is also the fundamental task of the African Revolution at this critical juncture. Years ago, in 1986, we summed up the qualities of our party that made it necessary to characterize the African People's Socialist Party as the vanguard in the pamphlet Build and Consolidate the African People's Socialist Party. We paraphrase a statement by former Black Panther leader Hugh P. Newton when he was a revolutionary during the Black Revolution of the 60s, which stated, the party must be the ox upon whose back the masses ride. That's what the party is. 
Uh, we pointed out that two 19th century European revolutionaries, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, offered a similar statement in quoting. The communists, therefore, are on the one hand, practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties of every country, that section which pushes forward all the others. On the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the conditions, and the ultimate general results of the proletarian revolution. That's what Vanguard is. That's the mission. We are the ox upon whose back the masses ride. And so how the hell can the masses ride an ox that it's itself crippled, infirm? That's what we say, Vanguard up. Vanguard up. We know that, that it was left to V.I. Lenin, the 20th century Russian revolutionary, however, to successfully build and lead the revolutionary organization spoken of by Marx, Engels, and later Newton. We quoted Lenin as saying, give us an organization of revolutionaries and we will overturn Russia and explain that Lenin set upon the task to build a revolutionary organization that indeed overturned Russia and became the prototype for revolutionary organizations of the oppressed and exploited peoples throughout the world. We can do no less. Lenin said, give us an organization of revolutionaries and we will overturn Russia. An organization of African internationalist revolutionaries, vanguard, cadre, will overturn the whole rotten, foul, capitalist social system that's responsible for the suffering of all the masses of the world, every disease that people are afflicted by, all the social contradictions result from the existence of this system. And what else could, what else could this system do? It was a system born of slavery and genocide, the theft of the indigenous lands of the indigenous people. And it excuses and apologizes for itself every day, every newspaper that you read, every sermon that comes from the pulpit, every movie that you see. All of that is an apology, an excuse, a validation of a social system born of murder, kidnapping, looting, rape, and what have you. That's the statement about what our responsibility is because it teaches the oppressed that you can't win, that you don't have stamina. You got enough stamina to build a whole world for them and have built it for them forever, but you don't have enough stamina. Teachers, the oppressed, uh, to, uh, to uh, not uh, uh, be interested in his own welfare. Teachers, the oppressed, to have no confidence in itself. That's what it does. But the party of the working class gives us a different message to the people, not just by what we say, but by what we do. We become as individuals in the party. We become as individuals in the party. That which all the other individuals, the African community in the aggregate, see the example uh, to emulate. That's who we are. We're not just people out here who go to work every day simply and who hustle every day, we are that example that the people must see to help them to understand what our possibilities are. We are the example of what uh, uh, Che Guevara characterized as the, as the new man or uh, what uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah was talking about uh, when we talked about uh, the, the new African, that's who we are. And in us, the people must be able to see their possibilities, who it is possible for them to be. And that's not easy. I was looking at something just recently. My wife is talking about she's, <coughs> excuse me, going through this process of, of changing her diet to eat a very clean diet. And initially, when she starts this process, uh, for the first four or five days, she's weak and lethargic and what have you, but after a while, the benefit kicks in. And she feels better than she's ever felt before. And that's how it is, trying to break out of this situation. Now, it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world to do. Once you become a junkie, once you become a junkie, withdrawal will, will hit you hard. 
when you try to walk away from it, but after you, after you get rid of it. That's the thing. And I predict that once you get rid of it, you're better than you were before you started it. Because that's just the way uh, things work with us, you know? So, such a party is the vanguard, the advanced attachment of the working class. It is a party of communists, a party of a new type. Such a party is the African People's Socialist Party. Our task then is now is to unite our people under the leadership of the black working class in the struggle for political independence, African liberation, and socialism. This political report must win the unity of our party members and the participants of our 7th Congress to the recognition of the gravity of your roles, your role as cadre, the advanced attachment of the African Revolution. This political report will demonstrate the material basis to be found in the history and accomplishments of the party and our understanding of the acute crisis of the parasitic capitalist system for having the confidence and courage to take up your proper role as leaders of the African Revolution. Our political report to the 2017 party plenary was titled Putting Revolution Back on the Agenda. In this report, we began to show how the party is the advanced detachment, quote, first of all, the imperialist crisis, the uneasy equilibrium with which we have been contending is manifesting itself with ever greater clarity in the political arena, especially as seen in the 2016 U.S. presidential campaign and election. Secondly, the neo-colonial African assimilationist tendency of our community, while opposed to the election of Trump, is making every effort to support the colonial capitalist system. That's what assimilation does. See, this is not just name calling when we talk about assimilationists and Uncle Tom's and stuff like that. Assimilation, whatever the intent, because that's not the fundamental issue. Uh, because the road to hell, as has been said before, is paved with good intentions. But the intent, but the consequence of this assimilationist movement is to keep us locked into the colonial relationship. You see, that's what it does. In fact, it validates colonialism uh, by having you fighting to be a part of it. It's a validation of your own oppression. So we say that uh, the, the neo-colonial African assimilationist tendency of our community while opposed to the election of Trump, yeah, they don't want Trump there necessarily, but it's making every effort to support the colonial capitalist system. The assimilationists are doing everything possible to keep Africans loyal to the system and the electoral process, primarily to the ruling Democratic Party, from whence flows their economic security, semblance of power, and influence. That's, you know, even cats who uh, uh, live uh, in North St. Louis, uh, who call themselves uh, office holders and things like that. Their influence and power is not as a consequence of the relationship they have to African people who has, have power, but to the system, to the ruling class, to colonialism. That's where their power stems. So they might be good people, and they might believe that virgins should marry, wear white when they get married and all of this kind of stuff, or that people should be virgins. But the point is that doesn't have anything to do with overturning the social system. The African People's Socialist Party is the revolutionary vehicle of the advanced detachment through which the conscious and organized African working class continues to wage the struggle for the socialist liberation and unification of our dispersed African nation. Again, we want it all. Instead of spontaneity, which allows the issues of the moment to determine our trajectory, our work is based on a plan stemming from a scientific theory. We continue to check up on our work, to measure our successes, and correct our errors, to make certain that our practice reflects and validates our theory. The party congress and our plenaries allow us to bring the membership of the party into this democratic process of charting our course. They grant the party leadership the authority to require centralized discipline from all our members and constituent organizations. The six party congress participants adopted the political report after serious discussions that began more than three months prior to the convening of the congress. The political report was truly a document of our whole party and the task the five-year plan laid out in the political report constitute, constitutes the party's direction that was voted for by the whole party. 
Our plenary process is the method of the party has adopted to continue summing up our work, of making our plan uh, reality and guaranteeing that we do not veer off on some opportunistic gambit based on the whims of any party organization, committee, member, or leader. Unquote. The resolutions and mandates adopted at our Congresses safeguard our party against spontaneity and opportunism, factors that distinguish our party and contribute to the conti continuity, which is key to our strategic approach. That when we say spontaneity, that is to say, uh, you know, I'm told that spontaneity is wonderful, you know, in love affairs and stuff like that, uh, but, uh, or can be, but the reality is that to be have a movement that's based on spontaneous stuff, which is what we see happening now. I mean, everybody's demonstrating about something all the time. And I think it's great that we demonstrate, but that should not be the demonstration of a specific act, a specific incident, of a specific revelation of some imperialist uh, uh, contradiction should not be the motivating force. We need to have an understanding of the social system that we're fighting against so that whatever we do, this specific instance contributes to overturning the social system. Otherwise, what you find yourself doing is fighting this immediate thing, which is a substitution of fighting for the long-term interests of the people. You can be taken off point at any given moment just to fight for this and fight for that. And you can never get to the real contradiction. So spontaneous, spontaneity is not something that we, 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 we look favorably on. We don't look favorably on. Even if we get involved in something right now, uh, the last uh, aggression that was made by... Uh, imperialism uh, in our communities or in the world. We should deal with that. But we are not informed just by that incident. How does involvement in this incident contribute to first uh, undermining the social system of the, of the, of the government or of the state that we are dealing with or the ruling class? One, and how does taking this on strengthen our position in terms of the ends that we are fighting for uh, ultimately? You know, this, is how, this is what informs what we are doing. Our Congress, uh, let's say, so uh, the resolutions and mandates adopted at our Congress to safeguard our party against spontaneity and opportunism, factors that distinguish our party and contribute to its continuity, which is key to our strategic approach. <laughs> our Congresses and plenaries are critical because since the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s, more than two generations ago, the African People's Socialist Party is the organization that assumed custody of the revolutionary struggle of the African working class and peasantry indeed, of the entire African nation. We are the party that constitutes a historical continuum from the previous era of black revolution of the 60s to its incipient resurgence today. Our mission has never been determined by the events of the moment. Events come and go, elections are held, coups overturn governments, police violence escalates from time to time. Our struggle faces setbacks and the social system, but the social system, that has arisen from slavery and colonialism remains the same. This is the essential, essential ingredient that must inform our analysis during each period. Our Congresses and plenaries contribute to our ability to hold the line, to protect, defend, and solve the problems of the revolution. This is what revolutionaries do. This is what a revolutionary party does. It is also true that the system of oppression under which the entire world and we live and struggle is a parasitic capitalist system that owes its existence to and is nourished by slavery and colonialism. A parasitic capitalist system that owes its existence and is nourished by slavery and colonialism. See, that's really important. It's really important for us to recognize that we're not just fighting against capitalism as, as, as it's generically uh, characterized. We are fighting against parasitic capitalism. Parasitic capitalism is that capitalism that was born through slavery and through colonialism. It is a parasite. It is a, Europe came out of this uh, feudalism through an, uh, a, a parasitic attachment on the rest of us, on Africa in particular, African people, <laughs> and the people who have been colonized around the world. For somebody, you hear white leftists always talking about they're opposed to, 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 to capitalism or they are fighting for socialism, but they aren't talking about the same capitalism that you should be talking about because uh, they won't recognize parasitic capitalism, a capitalism that has its origin in your enslavement of doing bad things to your mama. They won't recognize that. Uh, so they say, well, we're all in the same boat. 
But hell, we were all in the same boat uh, when we came here from Africa. We, we didn't row ourselves here. Somebody else was in the boat. We were just down uh, uh, in uh, below deck, and, and you were up on top. So uh, anyway, that's what's important for us to understand. So, it is also true that the system of oppression under which the entire world and we live and struggle is a parasitic capitalist system that owes its existence to and is nourished by slavery and colonialism. The legitimacy of any movement of the oppressed must, be ultimate, must ultimately be judged by its opposition to slavery colonialism and the capitalist system birthed by, this, by slavery and colonialism. Africans and the peoples of the world suffer from a dictatorship of a white nationalist and peerless bourgeoisie currently headquartered in the U.S. Africans and the peoples of the world suffer from a dictatorship of a white nationalist and peerless bourgeoisie currently headquartered in the U.S. While the selection of Barack Hussein Obama is, as the first African U.S. president in the August 9, 2014 police murder of 18-year-old Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, may have affected how we carried out our strategy and tactics, the reality of the parasitic capitalist colonialist domination of Africa and the world remain the same. This reality shapes our worldview. It makes us African internationals. We address the critical role of our party in the continuing process of solving the problems of the revolution in the political report to the 2016 plenary. Quote, since our inception in 1972, our party has functioned as, a, as the primary custodian of the African liberation struggle. That's a really profound statement. I, 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 I wrote this, uh, and I've read this over and over again, but it, it stands out, because when we say we're Vanguard, whatever organization claims, even claims it, on, in Africa or any place in the world, to be custodian, the primary custodian of the African liberation struggle, not the New Mexico liberation struggle, not the uh, Chicago liberation struggle, but the African liberation struggle. This is the role and responsibility we have assumed as the advanced attachment of the African Revolution. We have summed up all the lessons and contradictions of our revolutionary movement to reunite the African nation and liberate and unite Africa and African people worldwide under the leadership of the African working class. The African liberation movement suffered major setbacks since the defeat of the Black Revolution of the 1960s. Not only were giants like Patrice Lumumba of Congo and Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana brutally murdered and overthrown by repulsive, shameless, European-created neo-colonial stooges, but our movement was never able to resolve many of the key ideological and political <coughs> questions facing our people. This demoralized our people whose dreams and aspirations were spoiled by the disillusionment that followed our movement's defeat and demise. Inside the U.S., it was left to our party to sum up the significance of the life and death of Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King and the destruction of the Black Panther Party, along with the accompanying assassination and imprisonment. It was the African People's Socialist Party that forced the world to recognize that the African liberation movement is one struggle being waged across the globe on different fronts by a forcibly dispersed African nation held in colonial slavery in Africa and elsewhere over the last several hundred years. It was our philosophy, African internationalism, that brought this understanding to the forefront. Without African internationalism, it would be impossible to understand why Africans, sometimes called by an assortment of different names, suffer impoverishment, brutality, and impose ignorance all over the world." Unquote. As we state in the political report to the party's 2010 Fifth Congress, published as One People, One Party, One Destiny, quote, would capitalism and the resultant European wealth and American impoverishment have occurred without the European attack on Africa, its division, 
African slavery and dispersal, colonialism and neo-colonialism? The answer is no, 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 and a thousand times no, unquote. In the political report to the party's 2016 uh, plenary, we clarified, quote, it was African internationalism that helped to locate the millions of Africans that otherwise would be missing from history by false national identities that facilitate our colonization everywhere and deny Africans the confidence and resources that come from recognition that as a nation, Africans are more than a billion and a half strong. Let me say this. It was African internationalism that helped to locate the millions of Africans that otherwise would be missing from history by false national identities that facilitate our colonization everywhere and deny Africans the confidence and resources that come from recognition that as a nation, Africans are more than a billion and a half strong. Our party through practice and theory continues up to now to help people understand that despite the ongoing efforts by the U.S. to demonstrate otherwise, the black revolution of the 60s did not simply go away because our militants tired of struggle or came to enjoy our oppressed status in the U.S. Our revolution was militarily defeated through assassinations, mass jailing, slander, and unrelenting harassment. In a word, it was a war without terms that silenced our struggle. This is the understanding that allowed the African People's Socialist Party to recognize that the African charlatans, including Barack Hussein Obama, were elevated to high places as neo-colonial substitutes for genuine revolutionary African leaders of the past. Indeed, these charlatans, <clears throat> every one of them, are a result of the defeat of the revolution, not its success. We have led and participated in campaigns throughout the U.S. and all over the world informed by this understanding and steeled by practice that involved virtually every form of struggle. This is why we can say confidently that we are best prepared to lead our people to the reunification of the African nation and the liberation and unification of our African motherland. I want to say that, uh, I say this without, uh, without uh, denying the contradiction that exists within our party and among some of our members. Uh, in fact, it is recognition and struggling with these contradictions inside our party that contribute to this capacity, our ability to say that we are best prepared. We, we don't just wait till we get to the white ruling class to have these fights and stuff. We struggle inside the party, correcting contradictions, uh, de de defining weaknesses and problems in the work. As we, we don't just do this by setting up and saying, hey, let's sit down and look at contradictions, but in the process of carrying out the work and struggle. This is what gives us strength. When I said that uh, a, a, a person who was addicted and who comes out of it may be better than before, it's because as somebody who at one time was involved a lot in like uh, uh, weight resistance training, what you learn is that in the process of lifting the weights, you tear up the muscle cells. The cells get destroyed, get wasted, get broken up. It's in the process when they, re you, they repair themselves is when you're stronger. Like, unlike like running where you get the benefits right away, with weight resistance, you don't do that right away. You, you, <clears throat> you get the benefit over a period of time as the muscle repair itself. It's like when you get a callus in your hand, when you're using a shovel, uh, what have you, without gloves, if you're not accustomed to it, you get a blister in your hand. And that blister, when it recovers, when your hand recovers, it's a callus which means it's stronger than it was before you started. So we engage in these struggles inside our party. That some people who don't know what they're looking at can see as some kind of reckless stuff that's happening among us, but this is the stuff <clears throat> that we do <clears throat> to make us stronger. We come out of here stronger than what it was than when we went into it. And that's what, you know, that's why we say we are best prepared. We don't just struggle when we get to the white man. We don't just struggle uh, when we deal with crooks and charlatans in our, inside our own party. Because this is the vehicle for the liberation of our people. That means that we have these struggles in an ongoing process. We don't look to make struggles. We look to do the work. But when something happens in the work, 
that reveals itself as a contradiction. We engage, engage in dealing with this, and this is what makes us stronger. This is part of why we say we are best prepared uh, uh, to lead our people to a reunification of the opposition <laughs> and the liberation and unification of our African motherland. Unlike most who see the growing unrest roiling the world, the unremitting wars and the threats to U.S. hegemony in Africa, Asia, Latin America, the Middle East, and increasingly <laughs> the African domestic colony of the U.S. <laughs> with alarm, we of the African People's Socialist Party recognize this as an era of general imperialist crisis. Certainly, this is why the political report to the party's sixth Congress was titled, An Uneasy Equilibrium, the African Revolution versus Parasitic Capitalism, where we summed up, quote, the science <laughs> of African internationalism enable our party to avoid the ideological pitfalls that validate the assumption of the superiority of white people. Thus, we have never been diverted from our mission of capturing power and uniting Africa and our nation under the leadership of the African working class. Our party brought science to our defeated African liberation movement at a time when it was generally bogged down in racial and cultural nationalism that indulged in candlelight ceremonies, religious obscurantism, and nostalgia for an often imaginary African past. Through African internationalism, we were able to discover the material basis for the exploitation <coughs> of Africans and others in this world. With African internationalism, we can understand the material forces that work in the movement of history. We can clearly see the current shift, <coughs> excuse me, we can currently see the current shift in the balance of power between the oppressor and the oppressed, between Europe and the rest of us, between the white man and the so-called black man. We recognize, unquote, we recognize the reality that there is a great contest between the imperialist past that has defined the world for the last 500 years and the liberated future of a totally free and reunited African nation and the emancipation of the colonized peoples worldwide. All societies contain an advanced sector. These are people who, for whatever reason, stand out because of their willingness to step forward to address the pressing problems found in society at any given time. It is they who generally attempt to sum up the areas of social concern and to put forward solutions. The individuals who take on this important social task are those who comprise the advanced sector. Political parties are parties that are comprised of these individuals, but political parties are also parties of particular classes. In the development of capitalism, political parties have historically been representative of the colonial capitalist class. They represent the selfish interests of that class, even though the colonial capitalist class, because it is a minority exploiting class, must usually disguise its class rule as the popular will of the oppressed and exploited masses. Today, the African working class has our own organization that fights for the selfish interests of our class. Up to now, most of our political activism has taken place inside the ranks of the parties of our oppressors, the colonial capitalist rulers of society. They have been able to continue their rule because we have not had our own working class parties to advance our own selfish class interests that are diametrically opposed to the interests of our oppressors. A colonial, as colonial subjects of imperialist white power, Africans have only had access to the electoral process since the 1960s. Before that time, our political interests were usually determined by the white colonial rulers or by the African petty bourgeoisie and organizations they established. This has been generally true throughout the world, not just here. I mean, you know, 1965, of course, was when the so-called Voting Rights Act was passed in the United States that sort of uh, universalized uh, uh, suffrage, you know. But uh, throughout the world, so-called African independence it was in the 60s when you're looking at when, you know, much of this independence occurred. You know, there's some, you know, we saw uh, Ghana and, you know, earlier on and stuff like that, but generally it was the 1960s. 
As colonial subjects of imperialist white power, Africans have only had access to the electric process since the 1960s. Before that time, our political interests were usually determined by the white colonial rulers or by African petty bourgeoisie and organizations they established. In the U.S., some of these petty bourgeois-led organizations won popular acclaim because of their successful mobilization of the oppressed African masses to become directly involved in the movement for basic democratic rights under colonialism. And that's what you got to remember. You know, we've got some heroes. Uh, we can name people who were heroic uh, because they led a uh, struggle for democratic rights under colonialism. Martin Luther King read for democratic rights under colonialism. He didn't fight to overturn the relationship we have with colonialism. And uh, I can say the, the same thing as, uh, uh, you know, for other forces who became uh, important to us, some of whom were nationalists and, you know, who called for land and this kind of stuff, but they're not for overthrowing this whole colonial power. We, were not, we didn't colonize ourselves. So since then, ask the white man to give us some land so we can be free, it's not fighting against colonialism. It's fighting for a form of neo-colonialism. It's fighting to be able to survive despite the existence of a colonial power. You see. Similarly, on the continent of Africa was the African petty bourgeoisie that rose to prominence in the quest for political independence within the capitalist system presided over by imperialist white power. While some of the demands of the pro-independence African petty bourgeoisie appeared to be radical, they were generally incapable of challenging the capitalist system that has its origin in our colonial domination. This meant that the outcome was a capitalist outcome that now had African management. And sometime, I hope we have enough time to have some discussions about, especially during the 1960s, when we saw in Africa uh, organizations that, uh, that led movements that characterized themselves as, as socialists and revolutionary, et cetera, and actually engaged in armed struggle. Uh, but if you look at most of them today, uh, you will see the people, the masses are, generally speaking, in worse shape than they were then, not, not as a consequence of those governments being overthrown, but as a consequence of those power, those organizations that call themselves revolutionary at the time coming to power. You see the same kind of relationship. A meaningful notable exception to this was Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, that was organized by Marcus Garvey to pursue the liberation of African and Africans globally and the achievement of our independent capacity for self-government. UNIA uh, organized branches uh, I'm just trying to see. I want the expeditions. The UNIA organized uh, branches throughout the world with a membership of 6 to 11 million Africans. It created groundbreaking economic institutions that included a steamship line, factories, recording companies, and a host of other economic projects intended uh, to initiate a threatening, independent, anti colonial international economy for African people. Now, this is extraordinary. You think about this. This happens in in the 1900s, early, the first quarter of the 1900s, we had an organization from 6 to 11 million people. Uh, uh, it, it created uh, uh, steamship lines, factories, recording companies, uh, uh, other economic projects. I mean, numerous economic projects uh, that gave it uh, the character, uh, along with some of the other institutionalized components of that organization, of uh, of a, of a state, almost. This is Garvey did, you know, uh, uh, it's extraordinary. This is more than 100 years ago, and uh, t uh, uh, today we find ourselves uh, 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 in a place of fighting for uh, succor, uh, you know, inside the system itself. I mean, more than 100 years ago, Garvey had united uh, Africa and African people. The Garvey movement was incessantly attacked by international imperialist white power, especially the U.S. government, that falsely charged and imprisoned Garvey before deporting him to Jamaica, uh, his place of birth. While the UNIA never touted its working class constitution, it was a working class character of the Garvey movement that won Garvey the enmity of the African petty bourgeoisie of the era in the first quarter of the 20th century. Many of them especially the distinguished uh, W.E.B. Du Bois cooperate, cooperated with the U.S. government and others to destroy the government in part because of its black working class composition. We are the Garveyites of the 21st century.
Like Garvey, we do speak to the interests of the African nation as expressed through the interests and worldview of the recent of the independently organized African working class. The philosophy of UNIA was African fundamentalism, not pan-Africanism. The worldview of our party, 21st century Garveyites, is African internationalism, not pan-Africanism. As a party of the African working class, we are always consciously contending with the parties and interests of the oppressor nation and the exploiting capitalist class. The African People's Socialist Party is not the African working class. We are its advanced detachment, uh, the, its general staff, its vanguard, which like the class parties of the oppressor, looks out for the interests of the whole class, whether the whole class that is at any given moment capable of recognizing what its class interests are. It's important to say, we are not the African working class. We are its leadership, its advanced attachment. And because we've had people come into the party, especially you know, from the petty bourgeoisie, who become imitation black workers, you know, uh, you know who wear... Uh, uh, you know, what do you call them, overalls and, you know, and, and, and you know, boots that are unlaced and clumping around, looking ways uh, that, uh, that uh, is really a caricature of the African working class. <laughs> if you want to know what the African working class is, that ain't it. You know, you go to any Sunday to catch these African workers going to church or going to the clubs or just out in general speaking, that is not us. That's a caricature that's been created for us that is adopted, but we are not that. And it's reason really important to say that because what happens is in attempting, quote unquote, the be the working class, we take on a lot of the bad habits and stuff like that that's been imposed on the African working class. You know, a certain element of, uh, of uh, trained irresponsibility. Uh, uh, you know, a uh, certain element of uh, seeking pleasure in the, in the very few places uh, uh, allowed for that uh, in a colonial existence. What what can colonized people do? You don't have <laughs> you don't have uh, uh, a certain kinds of uh, uh, clubs and things like the upper class white people have, or even the African petty bourgeoisie. Uh, our pledge is found uh, 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 through uh, you know the alcohol and, and drug addiction and sex and their I mean our, the, the 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 ability the arena of pleasure. For the oppressed is very small, very narrow. Uh, and so we find ourselves often uh, uh, pre imitating, you know, pretending to be the working class by, uh, by descending to where the working class has been pushed, as opposed to recognizing that we are advanced attachment with the responsibility of raising the class up so that they can take its responsibility, you see. The African working class is always in a posture a resistance. This is most obvious in the behavior of young working class Africans who consciously defy convention uh, that usually defines how reasonable or civilized behavior should look. They are uh, constantly breaking out of the social boundaries imposed on our community by colonialism. And in many cases, they set new social and cultural trends, which uh, after initial strong ruling class and petty bourgeois uh, denunciation are uh, co-opted by proper colonial society. It's hard to see a TV commercial uh, that doesn't uh, somehow grab some hip hop or some other kind of uh, 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 you know, characteristic that comes straight from the African working class and young African working who are denounced all the time. Uh, the, the resistance of the African working class can be seen in the spontaneous rebellions and threats of rebellion that require an oppressive presence of the domestic colonial military police uh, waging barely disguised war on, in every African community within the U.S. and the entire world. When the African working class does not have uh, access to, uh, to its own African People's Socialist Party, their defiance is uh, most often not politically motivated and directed. When it is occasionally politically directed, it comes under the influence of the white rulers, sometimes transmitted by radical sectors of the African petty bourgeoisie. We have seen this recently in the aftermath of the 2014 uprising in St. Louis Ferguson, following the colonial police murder of Mike Brown. We have also seen the results of this indirect ruling class influence over the masses of African workers in Occupy Zania, South Africa. Uh, 
with the rise of the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela, and the host and the host of other radical sectors of the African petty bourgeoisie. Similarly, African working class protests are rolling the African continent, including the Democratic Republic of Congo. The weakness of the African Revolution is again exposed by the fact that the majority of African working class and poor peasantry do not have the advantage of the African People's Socialist Party, its own party, fighting for the selfish interests of the colonized African working class. The African People's Socialist Party has been the instrument of the African working class that continues to rally the class to his own interests, to his own side, so to speak. However, the party is not only the advanced detachment of the African working class, but as we have said before, we are the vanguard of the entire African national revolution. We have accepted the responsibility of liberating Africa and the entire forcibly dispersed African nation that suffers under the cruel weight of colonialism everywhere. The African People's Socialist Party is the leadership of the African working class, the most consistently revolutionary component of the African nation. But because the African, nation, African working class is the main social force of the colonized African nation, our responsibility is greater than simply leadership of the working class. The leadership of the advanced detachment of the African working class is an absolute, is absolutely, is a, an absolute necessity for the liberation of the entire colonized African population, including the African petty bourgeoisie that has an entirely different definition of what liberation means. The African petty bourgeoisie wants equality with the colonizers, preferring preferably with the colonial ruling class. One sect of the African petty bourgeoisie wants to get rid of the colonizer and its domination of the African nation. It is a patriotic sector of the African petty bourgeoisie because of its opposition to white colonial domination. However, this sector is not interested in overturning the system of capitalism that was created through colonial slavery. In the political report to the party's third congress held in St. Petersburg, Florida in 1990, we define the difference between uh, uh, petty bourgeois national liberation and the, and the national liberation of the African working class, although this passage speaks specifically to the situation of the U.S. domestic colonialism of our people, the principle is universal, and we quote, the national liberation of the aspiring black petty bourgeoisie is a liberation from the limitations uh, of its development into a full-blown bourgeoisie, limitations which are imposed on it by domestic colonialism, the imperialist rule by foreign dust, uh, gangsters. When we're saying a limitation placed on, its, uh, on the limitations of its development into a full-blown bourgeoisie, the African petty bourgeoisie has aspirations. It wants to be the bourgeoisie. It wants to have the same uh, kinds of resources, but colonialism denies it from having that. So its struggle usually is against the limitations that has been placed on it as a part of the colonized nation. Not to overturn uh, capitalism, but the, it's a struggle to get some of the action. <clears throat> And that's even when you see a uh, struggle that's happening in St. Louis with this uh, uh, NGA, the national, the, uh, the, what is it, the, the uh, National Global Geospatial Intelligence Entity that's taken up an all, an all total 1,000 acres of land in the African community that has been despoiled uh, consciously, purposely uh, by the rulers here and now uh, intend to put this spy station, uh, not just a spy in the sense of peeking uh, 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 you know, in your windows at night, uh, but spy that will use uh, drones and satellites and stuff like that to murder people and do right now from other uh, venues. And so they want to create this and the big contest that's been uh, uh, created uh, by the African petty bourgeoisie, some of them black elected officials is to get some of the action in terms of, of, of contracts and stuff like that to build a spy station on, on land that was once owned by Africans, uh, occupied by Africans and for, who were forcibly pushed out. 
So their thing is to get a piece of the action, not to overturn the system, not to overturn something that's killing black people and that's being established to kill people all around the world. Within this concept of national liberation is a germ of a future continuing exploitation of the working class by black bourgeoisie that has been liberated from the quote-unquote national oppression which prevented the emergence of a free, independent black boss. Such a national liberation is not in the interest of the colonized African working class. The national liberation of the working class is a liberation which will sweep away all forms of oppression and exploitation. The national liberation of domestically colonized African working class is not only interested in removing the oppression of foreign rule, it is also interested in destroying, when I say foreign rule, I'm talking about white power. It is also interested in destroying the class rule which exploits the workers and toiling masses of all countries where the capitalist system prevails. The national liberation of the working class is explicitly anti-capitalist and consciously a part of the worldwide socialist movement. So, let's see, I'm going to have to end. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to read quickly just a little more, and maybe we can get through this thing. Mm -hmm. In many writings, we have often quoted V.I. Lenin, the Russian revolutionary who designed the Vanguard, part, Vanguard Party that has influenced the definition of revolutionary party since that time. The African People's Socialist Party is a Leninist-type party based on democratic centralism. Lenin stated, quote, we are the party of a class, and therefore almost the entire class should act under the leadership of our party. That was Lenin's statement then. In the pamphlet, Build and Consolidate the African People's Socialist Party, we, explored, we explained, following the quote from Lenin, quote, however, within the domestically colonized population of the U.S., the two main contending social forces are the black working class, comprising 88 to 94 percent of the population, mm -hmm. and the primitive black petty bourgeoisie, which, generally speaking, has an inordinate amount of influence presently due to the military defeat of the black revolution of the 60s. This influence is also tied to one or another sector of the colonial white ruling class or the capitalist colonial state itself. In the past, when the political activity and ideology of the black petty bourgeoisie was generalized as an anti-colonial struggle for democratic rights, the black petty bourgeoisie constituted a progressive influence within our movement. However, with the victory of the struggle for democratic rights, which came as a concession uh, to the black uh, petty bourgeoisie and at the expense of the black revolution of the 60s, the black petty bourgeoisie realized its fundamental political aim and lost any historically derived progressive character it once had. Thus, the mantle of leadership, both for the struggle for national liberation and socialism, has fallen upon the shoulders of the most despised and feared black working class. Therefore, as the advanced detachment of the black working class the African People's Socialist Party assumes the leadership not only for almost the entire class, uh, but for almost the entire people, unquote. This is why we say we are the advanced attachment or vanguard of the African Revolution. The fact is that we are involved in a struggle for national liberation within which there is also a raging class struggle that grows sharper with the crisis of imperialism. The revolutionary aspirations of our people for happiness, the return of hundreds of years of stolen resources and the construction of a socialist system wherein material want can be conquered will be determined by the African working class having its own independent political vehicle, its advanced detachment leading the struggle. We are that vanguard. It is the profound duty of the leaders and members of our party to eagerly, enthusiastically accept this responsibility at this Congress, to take our party and people to the future that Africans desire and deserve. The U.S. government is currently the wounded reactionary chief imperialist regime of the world that led the counter-revolutionary response to international of an international imperialism to crush the liberation struggles of the peoples during the period of the 1960s when revolution was the main trend of the entire world. At our 1972 inception, the African People's Socialist Party inherited a political terrain that, character that was characterized by the fact that the masses had been shot and jailed out of political life. Revolution is characterized by the mass <clears throat> unbridled participation of the oppressed people in political life. And it was the defeat of the black revolution of the 60s that ended that mass participation. 
Our party has been busy organizing with the int intent of reintroducing the people to political life. We have created various organizations to win the active participation of African people to the task of overturning the colonial government's violent program to prevent us from rising up again. An example of such an organization is the International People's Democratic Uhuru Movement. Programs to prevent or crush anti-colonial resistance are called counterinsurgency programs. Counterinsurgency employs every form of warfare, psychological, economic, political, etc. However, all counterinsurgency relies on military force in the final analysis. Central to the most to most counterinsurgency program is what the colonial power calls population and resource control. Gentrification is an example of that. And what we see happening in North, North St. Louis, among other places, look at Harlem, look at Washington, D.C., look at what's happening every place in this country. Incidentally, coincidentally, somehow there's a meeting someplace where the white folks get together and say, let's go ahead and gentrify the black community. It is a form of gentrification that is occurs as a consequence of purposeful manipulation of economic uh, factors, institutions, and things like that that designed to mobilize white people in one way and to uh, and Africans in another way. And in St. Louis, we see it, and in Detroit, and in Chicago, the criminalizing criminalization of a whole African population that legitimizes every effort that's being made, even making Africans fearful to live in our own communities that are made dangerous, of course, by colonialism on the one hand, but a colonialism, a danger that is exaggerated by the media at every given opportunity that gleefully writes about the, uh, or reports on the last killing of a black person by a black person or three black people or black baby and all this kind of stuff like suddenly care about black babies being killed. Anyway, gentrification. And the uh, uh, whole thing about population and resource uh, uh, control. This is why the pr prisons are filled with Africans who might be otherwise available for revolutionary organizations. This is also why there is an unrelenting murderous presence of colonial occupied military forces of every, in every African community in the U.S. and most places in the world. Like the U.S., colonial government, however, our party has always understood that it is only a matter of time before the African working class reclaims our station at the forefront of the revolution. This is why we can never forsook revolution for some opportunist so substitute. When Mark, Mike Brown was murdered by a white nationalist citizen in police uniform, it, provided, it proved to be the straw that broke the proverbial camel's back. It ignited a fierce resistance among the young African working class in St. Louis Ferguson that mobilized Africans throughout the U.S. Our history and the sixth Congress of our party prepared us for this moment of imperialist crisis and rising consciousness among many sectors within the colonized African nation. Since our sixth Congress five years ago, our party has intensified our work on every front. We are winning. Comrades, delegates, brothers and sisters, we salute the history of unending resistance of our people and the great advancement of the people's struggle under the unrelenting leadership of the advanced detachment, the African People's Socialist Party is related to the Africa. Uhuru. Yeah. If necessary, we might go a couple of minutes over, you know. questions, uh, you can still submit them. Uh, Chairman, we have viewers from Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, Chicago, St. Louis, Boston, Kuwait, Birmingham, Israel, Philadelphia, Tampa, Denver, uh, Hoek, Van Holland, Netherlands, Louisville, Gainesville, Florida, San Diego, Fort Myers, Florida, Newark, New Jersey, and Caracchio, Indiana, apparently. Um, so we have some questions that have come in and some statements that have come in. Uh, T. Gordon is viewing from Indiana on YouTube, and he has a question. He says, Uhuru Chairman Omali Yishatela, how confident uh, should we be in the African Union in our struggle as revolutionaries? I feel like the African Union hasn't done enough and is complicit in the suffering of our people. 
You're right about your assumptions about the African Union. The African Union, you know, it was founded as the Organization of African Unity. And uh, it was founded, uh, pushed really by imperialist forces who uh, were trying to undermine Kwame Nkrumah's uh, efforts to build uh, one single uh, united uh, Africa. That was his objective. And as he was moving toward that, of course, in 1958, you know, Nkrumah had the first conference in Accra, Ghana, I think it was April, uh, to, in Accra, Ghana, uh, to, uh, of African uh, uh, independent uh, states. I think there might have been eight, uh, no more than 13 at the time, and uh, of, of uh, other forces. Uh, and so that happened in Accra. And uh, he was moving toward the total unification of Africa. He wanted a united Africa, and that's what he was fighting for. That's what he was struggling for. And in order to block Nkrumah, the imperialist forces facilitated this thing uh, with this meeting in, in, on uh, May uh, t uh, 23rd and 20, 24th and 25th in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, uh, where the Organization of African Unity was founded. And uh, people like, uh, <clears throat> like Singhor uh, 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 and others, uh, even people who we've come to love and respect, like Julius Nayeri, uh, uh, you know, worked to make sure that, uh, that what Nkrumah was trying to do in terms of uniting all Africa did not occur, and that, in fact, the Organization of African Unity was used uh, to codify, to legalize uh, the uh, colonial states and said that uh, uh, it made it illegal to do anything to destroy the colonial states. And so the Organization of Af uh, the, uh, the, the African Union is just the OAU uh, with, the, with the O missing. Uh, it, is, it is no fundamental change. And our freedom is not going to come as a consequence of... Uh, a gathering of heads of states. That's clear because the, the, the heads of state in Africa have a stake in uh, the existence of uh, a divided Africa. In fact, one of the things that they used against Nkrumah's propaganda was uh, Nkrumah wants to be the president of all Africa. And uh, uh, he wants to be over everything, which meant that there could not be these independent separate presidents and vice presidents and, and armies and stuff like that all over Africa. So uh, the neo-colonial states, the neo-colonial entities that they created uh, served as incubators for the African petty bourgeoisie and neo-colonialism itself. So it was like a self-reinforcing uh, uh, entity that was, that was designed to maintain the status quo. While in the meantime, the masses of African people, workers and peasants, uh, had no regard for these borders and were crossing them back and forth all the time, every time they could, uh, of course, they've gotten more sophisticated with the help of the United States and other entities in terms of reinforcing what the borders look like. Uh, 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 but, yeah, the AU is just the OAU uh, without the O, and it has, and, and that was established. The OAU uh, instituted uh, continental-wide uh, neo-colonial domination of Africa. Right, Uhuru, thank you, Chairman. We have a uh, question from Ingoni Off in Tampa. She asked, uh, how will the vanguard resist becoming the bourgeoisie once we come to power? Well, the, the thing about this is that uh, the vanguard uh, destroys the basis for the existence of the bourgeoisie. It destroys uh, capitalist production. It destroys uh, production uh, for uh, profit. It destroys that kind of social system. And so there is no material basis for the existence of a bourgeoisie. Uh, the, the vanguard will become the ruling class. It has to be the ruling class because it has to reorganize society, production. <clears throat> it has to even challenge some of the traditions and habits we've learned under white power. And you know what I'm talking about, sister. Uh, the kinds of things that we do right now, they, we have to be <clears throat> have that kind of leadership. So we have to have a vanguard that will destroy the bourgeoisie, destroy the material basis for its existence, uh, uh, create a social system where the working people, uh, and that's what we talk about the vanguard being uh, the advanced attachment of the working class. It is, it represents a class that is coming to power. We represent that class coming to power. That's the people who do the work that produces all the value, and now being the people who own and control the value as opposed to this minority that exists uh, under capitalism. And let me just say, it's important to say this because some people think that the capitalists are capitalists uh, just because of a state of mind, you know, that I'm a capitalist. I mean, you hear a lot of people talk about, I'm a capitalist. They don't, they don't, they can't even pay the rent. They don't even have, if they lost their job, 
uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, exist for two weeks. They are no capitalists. They're just dummies who might aspire to be capitalists as they understand, but they're not capitalists. And the capitalist is not just somebody who has, who has a, a good idea, who thinks about it. Capitalists represent something in the material world. It's owned and then controlling the means of production. That's what a capitalist is. That's what the capitalist class is as a class. Uhuru. All right, so at this time, we just have a few more comments. Uh, we have a comment from Kundai in Birmingham, Alabama, who says, Uhuru chairman, we must fight for ourselves and in the interests of Africa and not take on the burdens of the colonizing nation, destroy the norm. Hmm. And we have Nasir Alamini in Kuwait, who commented, uh, stamina and confidence to build, for the, to build for them, but not for ourselves. That is a profound insight. And then Chuck Galston commented, the chairman is giving it up again today. So those are all the comments we have. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, I want to say that, uh, you know, we hear all the time about this question of uh, vanguard parties and cadre, revolution and communism, as if uh, there is really uh, some kind of a blueprint that has been established or that simply what we've seen happen in the world can be just replicated automatically. But the conditions that African people suffer are extraordinary. Extraordinary. All the peoples of the world, of course, will suffer from imperialist domination and what have you. But you look at Africa, where the entire continent of a people, the entire continent has been conquered and then transformed uh, into this incubator for the production of human beings who will be sold, for the production of human beings who will be sold, and then where we have been forcibly dispersed all over the planet Earth, and we have been worked uh, for scores and hundreds of years for free. Our resources stolen from us, our power taken from us, so that we don't have the power to make our own determinations, that we are poor reflections of white power. We are poor reflections of white society. We are poor reflections of what white people have created to define. First, white people define themselves, created and define themselves, then they created and define us. This is, the, this is the struggle that we are engaged in dealing with right now, to take possession of our future in our own hands. This is what's being called up by the African working class. There have been white people who have actually been characterized as fathers of nations and things like that, who were conscious of the fact of what they were doing. I can't think of the name of the white guy from, is, from what is called Italy, who was referred to as the father of the Italian nation. But I'm, this, this quote from him that's so important to me is he said, we have now created Italy, now we must create, it, create Italians. You understand? We have created Italy, now we must create Italians. He was talking about the task before them. And I'm saying the task before us as the African working class because the European nation, yes, I said European, not French, not, not German, not British, the European nation uh, uh, was born through capitalism. It was born as a bourgeois nation. The African nation will be consolidated as a proletariat nation, a nation of the working class that will be let become as a consequence of what the African people, socialist party, the African international does in winning this revolutionary project worldwide. Uhuru. Yeah. So, um, we got time for a couple more. Sure, I think so. Comments and maybe a question. Akeem in the Netherlands commented, uh, censorship and information war on Iran. Instagram and its parent company, Facebook, are removing posts that voice support for slain Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani. Uh, to comply with U.S. sanctions. And Angelo... It's not just to, to comply with U.S. sanctions. The whole imperialist order has a stake in maintaining uh, this uh, narrative, false narrative they've created of Iran, which is not to say that Iran is the society, or uh, the Iranian society is the one that we would uh, create it, but that's up to the Iranian people. What it is, the problem is that the U.S. has decided how Iran would look, who's going to lead it, and whether or not they're going to be able to survive independently of the influence and direction of imperialism. So uh, all of them have a stake in this. I mean, how does Canada, a bloody camel, a Canada settler colony, that even today you go to this place they call Canada, 
You can see indigenous people who are standing on corners addicted to alcohol and living on the worst kinds of conditions as a consequence of colonialism, and they, they come out to validate, yes, the Iranians shot down their own airplane and what have you, and yes, they control communications, uh, and they want to make sure that we can't communicate effectively with each other. Even our sites are being shut down on a regular basis in the Uhura movement by, by YouTube and threatened to, with shutdown. And our discussions like this uh, uh, stopped in, 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 in mid-discussion uh, uh, by Facebook and whatever. They do not want us to communicate with each other, but they're too late. And they always are too late. By the time they recognize the significance of our influence, it's too late that the, the, the fact is that we are building this revolutionary project, whether we can get YouTube. Garvey didn't have YouTube, didn't have Facebook, and organized 11 million Africans around the world. So we will be able to do this, and yes, they would do everything they can, comrade, to keep us from communicating uh, with each other and with the world. Uhuru. All right, Uhuru. So we do have one last question. Let's do the last time. one. Okay. So I came in the Netherlands as uh, Uhuru Chairman. Once the class consciousness of the greater masses is achieved, can you lay out what are concrete practical steps to seize the means of production and build socialism? So that's supposed to be the last question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me just say that, no, I can't. Not, not, we don't even have enough time. I think it's an important discussion that we should have. I do believe that critical to all of this is Africa. I'm convinced that uh, the imperialism, uh, the capitalism that was born in Africa would die in Africa. I'm convinced that the significance of uh, increasing uh, imperialist forces congregating in Africa to try to rescue themselves from current crises or to grow themselves as new imperialist forces, all of that stuff in Africa places them in a central location uh, where the African Socialist International will be able to surround them and uh, be able to put, uh, that's what the significance of uh, ASI, all this, all this stuff about five states and, and Black Belt South and other, uh, or, or Ghana or uh, Nigeria, all that stuff won't work for us. We have to have the ability to draw them in. They're already in there. We want all of them to come in there, but have the ability once in there to surround them in Africa and then surround them from outside of Africa, where we are in St. Louis, where we are in the Bahamas, where we are in Cuba and all these other places. We will bring it to its knees. We will bring it down collectively. That's why the African Socialist International is so important. That's why we have to come into organization, come into the party, because that's the way forward. Uhuru. Let's give it up for uh, the Omali Talk and Chairman Omali Isatella. And uh, we want to thank all of the viewers online for your questions. Because of time, we want everyone to know that if your question was not answered, one of our moderators was fine with you to make sure the chair receives your question. This study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda, Winning the War of Ideas. For your worldwide revolutionary news and analysis, visit theburningspirit.com. For Revolutionary Radio, dynamic shows and music by Africans all around the world, tune into Black Power 96 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power Group, the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android, or online at blackpower96.org. Did you unite with what you heard today? I want to learn more about how you can get involved with the African People's Socialist Party. Visit the APSP, visit APSPUhuru.org for all information regarding how you can apply. Also, order your copy of Chairman Amali Isitella's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, The Political Report to the Seven Continents, at burningspearmarketplace.com. This year on MLK Day, participate in a project that carries on King's legacy, looking for an MLK volunteer opportunity that works for the same goals as the movement in the 1960s for black freedom, economic development, and self-determination, Take part in MLK Day event and volunteer projects on Monday, January 20th, 2020, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Events are located at the Uhuru Houses in Oakland, California, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, as well as, uh, I'm sorry, Uhuru Furniture and Collectibles at, uh, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and Oakland, California, as well as the Uhuru House in St. Louis. Uh, if you're in Philadelphia, uh, reserve at Uhuru MLK Day Philly on Eventbrite and meet at Uhuru Furniture on 832 North Broad Street.
Uh, time is winding down. Register today for the African People's Socialist Party's 2020 plenary following our seventh Congress happening February 1st and 3rd in St. Petersburg, Florida, themed the Vanguard of Unity of Theory and Practice. The plenary will feature a keynote presentation from our chairman, reports from our party's departments and organizations, workshops on socialism, reparations, African internationalism, and so much more. You can register uh, and read uh, the call to the plenary today at APSPplenary.org. On March 27 through 29, 2020, the African National Women's Organization will be holding the Black Women's Convention, Sisters United for Revolution in, in Philadelphia. Registration is open for this dynamic event at anwobwc.eventbrite.com. Come see the leadership of revolutionary African women on the front lines for revolution. Featured here will be presentations from African women. So again, we want to thank everybody for participating, and we have one other thing before you go. That's the Black is Back uh, uh, Electoral School. Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparation will uh, have its uh, electoral school uh, in uh, St. Louis uh, the first, well, April, what is it, 12th and 13th? Does anybody have that information? Well, it will be in St. Louis. You can go uh, uh, to blackisback.com, blackisbackcoalition.org, uh, and get information on exactly when the date is going to be. Uh, comrades like Charles Barron and Jesse Todd, who are both elected officials who are trying to serve people, will be there as well as Glenn Ford, Jamal Baraka, comrade out of uh, uh, Benton Harbor, Michigan, Reverend uh, Pinckney, uh, uh, Betty Davis and Ralph Pointer from out of New York, who are extraordinary uh, long-term uh, freedom fighters, uh, Cam Howard uh, from Chicago doing reparations work there, has been doing for a long time. So a lot of people will be here, and uh, uh, comrade uh, uh, Diop Ulubala, uh, working around the black community control of police. Uh, these will be uh, things that will be featured in the discussion that we'll have uh, around uh, electoral politics and teaching people how uh, to run and how to contest uh, elections and helping people to understand that uh, 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 electoral uh, politics is not the only vehicle, not even the vehicle for the winning our liberation, but one that we can use uh, uh, to uh, enhance our uh, position in the struggle for our liberation. Uhuru. Thank you.